So uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, this is a great honor for me to come here and uh, to join you to celebrate uh, Freeman's uh, 90th uh, birthday. Uh, Freeman has always been a role model and a hero for me. He, uh, he is kind of like what all young uh, theoretical physicists would like to be. And uh, I admired his work uh, by reading his papers. But for the first time when I met him, yes, uh, I, got my, uh, I did my postdoc at KITP in Santa Barbara, at that time still called ITP. And afterwards, I joined IBM Armadon. And uh, they, uh, within the entire IBM laboratory, there's a distinguished lecture series once a year. And he came to IBM Armadon to, to give a very uh, interesting lecture. And I was a young staff member. And I was <laughs> very, very. Uh, grateful that uh, he was willing to spend an hour with me uh, as a young uh, starting research uh, member at uh, IBM. So this was a very uh, memorable uh, moment uh, for me. So actually during David's talk, uh, he mentioned that there was this a period of triumph and uh, followed by confusion. So after the great success of uh, uh, QED, where, whom uh, Freeman helped to, uh, to pioneer uh, in the 50s, uh, it, in the 60s was actually during a time of confusion for a lot of the high energy uh, physicists and David uh, explained some of the confusion uh, during his uh, beautiful uh, lecture. But what Freeman did uh, while he was uh, during this period of confusion uh, is he wrote a, a series of very uh, important paper whose significance and impact is only growing uh, with time. In 1960s, uh, he decided to write a serious paper on a subject at that time seems to be totally unrelated to the frontier of particle physics. He decides to study random matrix theory. When nuclear physics became too complicated, Wigner initiated the idea to study uh, without a model, but assuming just the Hamiltonian, still within the Hamiltonian formulation, but assuming all the entries are random, but still, remarkably, there's a lot of things you can say. And following uh, Wigner's initial work, uh, Freeman started a series of three or four papers, I forgot, uh, but uh, he systematically classified different ensembles for random matrix into orthogonal ensembles, uh, a unitary ensemble, and symplectic ensemble. And particularly, his uh, classification of the time reversal invariant has two different kinds, either orthogonal, when the time reversal operator squared becomes one, or the symplectic, when time reversal squared equals to minus one. And that is actually the most interesting case. And you will see that this work really foreshadowed <coughs> A lot of the development uh, in uh, topological insulators, uh, as we know today. And actually, after Freeman's classification, uh, Zimbabwe extended it from three classes to 10 classes. And that has become the so-called 10-fold way in classifying topological states of matter. So this is a really a paper that's ahead of his time for like 50 years. Uh, unlike his QED work, which was instantly recognized, this one was. so. Uh, David explained uh, beautifully our quest for fundamental laws of physics, going to the most fundamental level, finding the smallest building block uh, of uh, particles and uh, what, the, uh, what are the laws governing their interaction. I work in a field called kinetic matter physics, and there the goal is to ask ourselves if you understood these elementary building blocks, how are they put together, and how the different phases of matter that you can have. And uh, for example, we can have uh, crystal state, uh, magnet, and superconductor. These are various electronic states of matter as we put the same electrons, the same building blocks, subjected to the same laws of physics, namely the simple Coulomb interaction. And yet, they can find themselves in these very different and yet so interesting different states of matter. So this is the pursuit of my discipline, condensed matter physics. And so far, after all these uh, lot of interesting states of matter were discovered, we like to also formulate a paradigm of how to classify them. And one paradigm is according to Landau, uh, the symmetry, uh, the, the principle of broken symmetry, in the sense that the crystal is uh, not translationally invariant, even though the elementary interactions are. And the magnet, even though the electrons have completely rotational asymmetric interaction, a magnet, once it's formed, picked a direction. This is how, uh, bless you, how we can, with a compass, uh, find the directions north from source. And a superconductor breaks a more subtle uh, symmetry. So after a while, then you say condensed matter looks pretty boring because you may find yet another state, but uh, the paradigm did not change or did not shift. 
So that's why when the excitement came about the topological insulator, that really generated great interest because it's not only yet another state of matter we find in condensed matter, but the principle has been changed. The paradigm has shifted. So these are the states of matter. Uh, for example, this is a picture of a two-dimensional topological insulator uh, realized in a quantum well, which I will tell you a little bit about, about mercury terrorite. And inside, it's completely insulating, but the electrons are only running on the boundary or on the edge of this system, but with a perfect correlation that upspin is going around in a clockwise way, and the downspin is going around in a counterclockwise way. Uh, this is the picture of a three-dimensional topological insulator. It looks beautiful, but it's actually real experimental data. If you take a piece of material, in this case, bismuth terrorite, which is insulating the bulk, but when you do photo emission experiments to look at the electronic states, you find they're gapless on the surface, and furthermore, they form this beautiful Dirac cone structure, uh, which is on the uh, front page of the Physics Today in uh, 2010. So even more remarkable, uh, so uh, in uh, physics, we always pursue this dream that we can conceive an uh, idea purely out of mathematical beauty, and then eventually you do experiment and find it to be true. Such was the case with Einstein's theory of general relativity, with Eddington's uh, discovery of the bending of the light, Dirac's prediction of, by taking some square roots uh, seemed to be a pure mathematical game, but square roots always give you plus and minus solutions, and out of that he predicted antimatter, just like uh, David said, it's uh, one of the greatest triumphs. In condensed matter, almost all the states of matter was discovered uh, serendipitously, experimentally first, uh, like the superconductor, uh, the quantum core effect, and so on. But the field of topological insulators is different. All topological insulators were theoretically predicted before they were experimentally uh, realized. So in front of this very distinguished audience with high mathematical sophistication, I'd like to explain to you topological insulator with two profound mathematical equations. One is 2 equals to 1 plus 1, and the other is 4 equals to 2 plus 2. Uh, so imagine that if you have in one dimension, uh, in, in, imagine the simplest possible case with a spinless particle, but fermions. But then in one dimension, you still have two degrees of freedom. You can go forward or you can go backward. Now, in this case, if they hit some impurity, what was moving forward hits the impurity, can be kicked back. So a resistance can arise in this wire. So what you can do is to decompose these two into one plus one. And that's actually the fundamental equation of the quantum Hall effect. In quantum Hall effect, there's a strong external magnetic field that picked a sense of motion. And in the strong quantizing limit, inside they all form some closed cyclotron orbits. So essentially, they cannot conduct at all. But on the boundary, they form skipping orbits. So when they merge together, they form one channel, which is only moving forward on the upper edge. And on the lower edge, they form another channel, which is moving backward. So this is really like like a highway system uh, that we have today that's a spatial separation of counter moving traffic. And that is uh, possible because of the strong external magnetic field. So once you achieve this composition, decomposition of 2 equals to 1 plus 1, then if there's an impurity here, then the, the electrons hitting this impurity will simply take a detour and move forward. Because the alternative is for it to jump all the way to the other side of the highway, and that probability is exponentially suppressed. So very unlikely to happen. So in condensed matter physics, we have superconductor, which is a form of a dissipationless transport. But quantum core effect is another form of dissipationless transport. Uh, it's exponent or the dissipation is basically exponentially suppressed. So this is a beautiful discovery, as you know, quantum Hall effect, the discovery of which was twice uh, awarded with the Nobel Prize. But it was not practical, because it uh, requires an external, uh, extremely large external magnetic field. You might think this kind of principle can be easily used in electronics into your laptop computer, but it's not, uh, because it requires this extreme condition of a very large external magnetic field. What do you do? What you do is to generalize. If somebody can write down the profound equation of 2 equals to 1 plus 1, if you multiply a 2 on both sides, you get 4 equals to 2 plus 2. Right? So now why you have 2? Because the electron here, uh, we forgot about the spin degree of freedom of the electron. Electron actually has a spin. So even in one dimension, the electron can be spin up or spin down. It can move forward or backward. 2 times 2 is 4. Now you rewrite this 4 into 2 plus 2 in the sense that you have upspin, uh, like doing the quantum core effect. 
uh, and the down spin doing the opposite quantum Hall effect. So it's as if you're replacing the external magnetic field, which gave you a sense of rotation, now replacing the external uh, magnetic field by internal degree of freedom of the electron with the spin selecting the direction of the chiral motion, uh, up spin going around one way and down spin going around the other way. So this is a picture of an extreme form of spin orbit coupling because the direction of the spin uniquely tell you how to move in orbital direction. But then you will say, wait a minute. So in this case, we have some advantage because the electron has some impurity. It has no other way of moving, but uh, it cannot move back because it can only move forward. But what happens here? If I hit the impurity, what was moving forward cannot be on the same side of the street, can be kicked back. Uh, why isn't this a problem? So it turns out that quantum mechanically, they cannot do that. And the reason they cannot do that is deeply related to uh, what I was just talking about in Freeman's work, that the time reversal operation in quantum mechanics is extremely profound. Operating twice gives you a minus sign rather than a positive sign. So imagine on this side of the highway, you have two traffic, up spin going forward and down spin going backward, and you hit a non-magnetic impurity, which is time reversal invariant. But then there's always two ways of going back. According to Feynman, we have to add up all possibilities. One is the electron moves around the impurity in a clockwise way, but it also have to rotate its spin because only down spin can move back. So the spin also rotates adiabatically from up to down, let's say by angle of pi. Now the alternative is the, for the electron going around the impurity, kicking back in a counterclockwise fashion, but then the spin also have to rotate counterclockwise from up to down. In this case, it will be minus pi. So the net difference will be pi minus minus pi, which is 2 pi. And it's a profound uh, consequence of quantum mechanics that if you have spin 1 half and rotate that by 2 pi, you get a minus sign. So then these two possible ways of scattering back always interfere with each other destructively because of the minus sign. So this is a beautiful, beautiful principle related to what uh, Freeman was doing in 61, that time reversal has two possibilities. If it were boson, it would not work. Fermion, t squared equals to minus 1, give you this very strange property that if you rotate by 2 pi, it gives you a minus sign. So you can already sense that there's something where, when we ex try to explain that to undergraduates, we say it's like an uh, ant moving on a Mobius strip. Once they go back, it, it ends up at, at the opposite side. And this minus sign is the crucial thing. And this is what Freeman identified to be the symplectic ensemble with t squared equals to minus 1. So, so far, in uh, solid state physics, uh, quantum mechanics plays a very, very important role. And this property of spin 1 half we already use. That it, uh, once you rotate by 2 pi, it gives you minus 1. But so far, relativity does not play uh, such an important role in uh, solid state physics. But this spin orbit coupling, as Dirac predicted, out of the one of the uh, Dirac's greatest triumph of gra Dirac's equation, of course, is the prediction of the antimatter. But uh, another, <laughs> for condensed matter, maybe uh, also a very important consequence is that the spin orbit coupling comes out of his equation with the right uh, magnitude of 2 rather than 1. So this now becomes a very important uh, ingredient that this effect only happens when you have strong spin orbit coupling, when you have topological insulator. So now where, so this is, looks like a beautifully profound uh, principle. Where can you find that uh, in real nature? So indeed, the community was excited about this matter can in principle exist. And there's a deep principle uh, behind its protection. But where can you find it? So the whole community was very confused. That's when we came to Singapore, whenever we get confused. In, 19, uh, in 2006, uh, Professor Poa and I co-organized a conference on spintronics. And there were many distinguished speakers on uh, the subject of spintronics. And one of them is Professor Lawrence Mullenkamp. And at the conference, he showed this diagram. So this is a diagram of binary semiconductors, binary meaning made of two elements, semiconductors, plotted in the space of energy gap and lattice constant, both of which are very important because the energy gap tells you that if emits light, what kind of the spectrum of the light it emits. And lattice constant also pretty important because it tells you uh, how to put different materials together. So when I at this conference in Singapore and looked and looked, suddenly I find something very, very strange about this diagram, that it has an absolute zero for the energy. So all these materials have a positive energy gap, and there's one material which has a negative energy gap. 
And then I suddenly remember something uh, when I was a graduate student. Some, some strange results you remember uh, as a graduate student relates to the first talk we heard this morning, that if you consider radiative correction of the rock fermion to a photon propagator, this is, of course, what Freeman studied uh, back in the days of QED, but not do this for the 3 plus 1 dimensional QED, but for the 2 plus 1 dimensional QED. Then it induces not an f mu nu square term, as you would do in the four, a 3 plus 1 dimensional QED, but rather you induce a Chen Simons term. Furthermore, the coefficient of the Chen Simons term changes disruptively when the sign of the mass changes. So that was always, usually in physics, things change continuously. But there, when you change the sign of the Dirac mass, the coefficient of the Chen Simons term changes disruptively. That was a very, very strange result that struck me when I was actually a student in high energy physics. But I took the Dyson advice that if you want to work on a theory, you should work on something that can be experimentally tested within the next 50 years of your life. So I decided so quickly to switch to kind of matter physics. But that lesson that I learned as a student uh, played a, a very significant role. Because when I saw this diagram and say everything else is positive, maybe most of the materials are trivial, but then there's one material that has a negative mass. That's where you find topological insulate. So thanks again to Professor Paul when you organized this conference. When we put together experimentalists and theorists together, some magic can happen, a spark can happen. So now what exactly do we mean by this uh, business of negative energy gap? So usually you have the S orbital and the P orbital of an atom. The P orbital has a spin orbit splitting because it has carries angular momentum one coupled to the spin, it splits to P3 half and P1 half. And then when in a solid, these atomic levels merge into a band. And that's the conventional situation. But imagine, uh, we all know that the size of the spin orbit coupling scales with the quartic power of the atomic weight. So by the time you get to mercury, which is very heavy, the spin orbit splitting is very large. So it's actually so large that it overwhelms the original difference between S and P. So in mercury terrorite, the energy level is uh, opposite, with the P level lying above S level, uh, whereas in conventional material, it's S above P. So that allows you to build some sandwich structure when you grow these two different materials together. Canyon terrorite is ordinary, mercury terrorite is inverted. Then you can continuously tune uh, as you change from the thickness from negative, uh, for smaller than a critical thickness to a larger than critical thickness. These energy levels change from S above P to P above S. And you can predict very precisely where this happens is when the thickness is about 6.1 nanometer in thickness. Uh, and when you construct, uh, try to construct a model of this material, mercury terrorite, <clears throat> we find that it's a beautiful emergence of the Dirac equation. So we, of course, start with Dirac equation, but we say low energy limit is a Schrodinger equation. But when you go to even lower energy limit, this is like another one of Escher's painting where the waterfall falls down but goes back. So that uh, a Dirac equation emerges again. That if you have the S orbital spin up and spin down, P orbital spin up and spin down, when you try to construct the low energy effective theory of this model, you actually find that on the diagonal element, you have something which looks like a mass. And on the off diagonal element, because S and P have the opposite parity, the coupling has to be linear in momentum because that matches the difference in the parity. So the mass uh, in this Dirac equation has then the interpretation of the energy difference between S and P. And that is something that's continuously tunable. In the world of high-energy physics, mass is determined once for all. But now, in this kind of matter system, by simply changing the thickness of the mercury terrorite layer, you can change the sign of the mass. That's when we got very, very excited. Right? So now, uh, if the sign of mass is negative and outside you can always view it as positive, then the sample boundary looks like a Dirac mass domain wall. It traps some bound state uh, for each given longitudinal momentum kx. And uh, as you change the longitudinal momentum kx, uh, this bound state level change, and that is what sweeps out a one-dimensional dispersion relation. So you notice at this point, when kx is equal to 0, these two solutions are strictly degenerate. And that degeneracy is guaranteed by a symmetry, namely the time reversal symmetry. Spin orbit coupling respects time reversal symmetry. And in a time reversal invariant system, there's a Kramer's theorem, which says that the energy level has to form a doublet. 
and this point is exactly a Kramer's doublet point. So this energy uh, then connects the conduction band and the, the valence band, and they can you cannot have avoided crossing, but not with, not without by uh, pre uh, violating the time reversal symmetry. So this is the moment when we predicted theoretically that this material we predicted the first topological insulating this material, and the reason we predicted was from a deep theoretical uh, lesson that we learned that uh, the mass positive versus negative is actually a topological phase transition. So then we wrote up this uh, science paper in 2006. Uh, actually, there were, uh, when you look at the date of the Singapore conference was in May. Uh, the science paper we submitted was in August of 2006. Uh, that was very quick. Once you have the idea, uh, everything can be worked out very simply. And then uh, only less than a year later, uh, the uh, group in Würzburg, Germany, did the experiment. And they find that they can actually, by very precise nano control of the thickness, they can either make it less than 6 nanometer, which is a trivial insulator, or thicker than 6 nanometer, which is a non-trivial insulator. And uh, when they uh, do the experiment, they find the trivial insulator indeed does not conduct at all when the Fermi level is in, inside the gap. But for this non-trivial insulator, when the Fermi level is inside the gap, you find that there's actually a finite conductance, uh, roughly quantized to be 2 e squared over h. And furthermore, it directly violates the Ohm's law. Because the Ohm's law says that if you change the sample width, the conductance should go up. And that that's, if you have bulk conduction, you would have more channels to conduct. But if you only have the edge channel conduction, it will not change because you still have two edges. And so that is uh, the, the different traces, what it shows. So that immediately uh, kind of created a new field of topological insulator realized in the first material, which is mercury terrorite. So today, you can actually not, these are kind of indirect experiment of this edge state picture, but my colleague uh, Catherine Moller at Stanford has a very sensitive squid loop from which she can detect very small magnetic field in a spatially resolved way. But actually, just to make a long story short, by looking at the magnetic field distribution, uh, when the Fermi level is in the N or P type region, where you have bulk conduction, or when you tune the Fermi level into the gap region, nominally gap region, but still having edge state, and she finds that the current is indeed purely localized at the edge. So a direct experimental proof of this edge state picture of topological insulator. So then the search goes on. Uh, so mercury terrorite has an uh, energy gap about 10 uh, milli electron volts. And that's why Santa Barbara is actually the world's center for mercury terrorite because there's a lot of defense contractors which uses this small property of the small gap to construct infrared detectors. But if you want to make some electronics that works at room temperature, uh, room temperature energy scale is 30 milli electron volt. So you would like to find something that has a larger energy gap than mercury terrorite. But uh, the discovery of the mercury terrorite as the first topological insulator shows where in the periodic table to look for this material. You should look for them in the lower right corner of the periodic table uh, because the lower right means it has heavy elements. And when you have element, heavy element, you have strong spin orbit coupling, and they can drive this bending version, which gives rise to topological insulated behavior. So when you look at where mercury terrorite is, you look nearby. You see bismuth terrorite, bismuth selenite, and so on and so forth. So that's how we discovered the next generation of topological insulated bismuth selenite, uh, which has this quintuple layered structure. And uh, when you look at the energy levels, the p orbital states, they form bonding and anti-bonding state, but also there's a crystal field splitting because only the z direction uh, is uh, inequivalent to x and y. And you find then the, when you drive the spin orbit coupling, again, there's a level inversion. So we did actually theoretical calculation again before the experiment was carried out. Uh, Nature gave us three, four different materials uh, with the permutation of uh, uh, bismuth with antimony and tellurium with selenium. And actually, Nature not only gave us three a nice topological insulator. She also gave one which is not. So just to test, uh, it's a very constrained test of the theory uh, that this one does not have enough strong spin orbit coupling and remains as a trivial insulator. But now when you look at bismuth selenite, it has a nice energy gap of 0 0.3 eV, which is 300 milli electron volt, uh, 10 times larger than room temperature. So this is a remarkable, this beautiful phenomena of quantum protection topological physics, usually you might think it's very 
beautiful things are very um, fragile, but these can exist uh, at temperature up to 10 times higher than room temperature. So you have a conduction band, you have a valence band, and you have this beautiful topological surface state which connects the conduction band and the valence band. And the reason, again, is because the spin orbit coupling is so strong that it drives a bending version. So in a sense, it has a der negative Dirac mass in the, in the problem. And so when you have a negative Dirac mass, the surface now, rather than the edge, here now it's a 3D material. Now the surface looks like a mass domain wall, and that traps a unique surface state, which has this beautiful property that it's located at the gamma point, and, uh, and uh, it has forms this uh, Dirac cone. So you recall uh, graphene is very popular here uh, in uh, Singapore, and uh, graphene also has Dirac point, but it has four. So top surface of topological insulate is one quarter of graphene. So when I gave this talk in front of Andrea Gaim, uh, he immediately raised his hand and said, So Chen, you're completely wrong. Uh, you should say graphene is four times the topological insulator. <laughs> That's before he got the Nobel Prize. Uh, so, but anyhow, uh, uh, so this is the, this beautiful topological surface thing. But also, it has some kind of a signature that reminds us of the world of particle physics. Remember what is neutrino. Neutrino has a unique handedness that it's a left handed neutrino but right handed anti neutrino. When you look at this picture, the, uh, the spin has a unique direction dictated by its momentum, which is sometimes called spin momentum locking. But the spin being tangential to the momentum, it forms a left handed helix on the upper Dirac cone and a right handed helix on the lower Dirac cone. Exactly the property uh, similar to that of a neutrino. I have more to say about that later. So, but a simple cartoon picture is that the ordinary insulator, once it reacts, uh, it wipes out the surface state. But topological insulator, if, even if it reacts, first of all, the surface uh, is naturally existing, but even if it reacts, it simply sinks down a little bit. So that's kind of a picture of the topological prediction, uh, protection. So this kind of surface state can be uh, seen experimentally by an uh, upper photo emission experiment. By kicking out the surface electron, you can map out its dispersion relation. And there's a textbook Dirac cone on this surface state. Uh, that was an experiment done at uh, Stanford on business terrorite. Uh, Princeton University, Zahid Hassan, uh, has done a beautiful experiment in this field. And uh, he also sees the Dirac cone uh, for business selenite. And he also did a heroic experiment to figure out the spin polarization. And it's exactly as it predicted. It forms a left-handed helical cone. Now, uh, this is also an opportunity for China uh, to, uh, to play a leading role in this field. And this is the experimental setup by Professor Qi Kun Shui at Tsinghua University. And over the past uh, many years, he has invested heavily in building a set of equipment that integrates uh, the MBE growth of the material, but vacuum connected with STM and angular resolved photo emission. So that it enables him to do a layer by layer test of the spectroscopy inside the vacuum as you grow them layer by layer. So this is something that uh, is universally admired uh, by many uh, of his com competitors who are now poorer than he is because he is very, very well supported by the Chinese government. So now uh, this is, uh, uh, he has done a first beautiful experiment by putting a magnetic field. Now you get the level quantization uh, of the Dirac cone, but with a unique signature that unlike a quadratically dispersing band, if you have a Dirac dispersing band, the lambda level spacing is not constant, but behaves like a square root of b. And that is something you can detect by looking at these different lambda level indices. You see that indeed falls into this square root of b dependence. Now, that was the story about the topological insulator as of last year. This year, there's a, another great discovery announced, and this time out of China, out of Qi Kun Shui's uh, group. Uh, it, this is the story of the discovery of the quantum anonymous Hall state. So I talk about the quantum Hall state due to the external magnetic field. Quantum spin Hall, which completely reveals uh, the external magnetic field, it has a full time reversal symmetry. But now, when you do not have external magnetic field, but introduce magnetic moments into the system, then without lambda levels, without external magnetic field, we predicted theoretically that it can kill one set of the edge state, but have one another set remaining. So this system will have a quantized Hall effect, 
without any external magnetic field. And that was recently discovered and it was announced in the March of this year. Uh, the theoretical work goes back in 2008 and uh, 2010. Again, we predicted the detailed materials, uh, how do you dope them with magnetic elements, uh, namely with manganese to mercury terrorite, with chromium to bismuth terrorite. And basically, uh, when we induce a phase transition in a time reversal invariant system, upspin and downspin have to go through exactly the same phase transition. That's why it's only a spin hole effect, not a charge hole effect. But once you break the time reversal symmetry by magnetization, the phase transition does not have to coincide. And then there's an intermediate regime when the upspin went from trivial to non-trivial, but the downspin is still trivial. So then you only get one set of edge states rather than two. So it's this picture of going from two set of edge states, as in the case of quantum spin hole, but introducing magnetic moment, it goes into the quantum anonymous hole state. And so this is the set of experiments that you see, that uh, as you go uh, take the external magnetic field, and even when the external magnetic field is equal to zero, you find there's a quantized Hall plateau, and at the same time, there's a very small uh, longitudinal, uh, uh, longitudinal resistance. This is a, as a function of the external gate voltage, and you see, indeed, that there's a Hall plateau, and a small, uh, there's a strong dip for the longitudinal resistance. So this kind of picture you will have seen before as a function of external magnetic field, but now at zero external magnetic field, but as a function of the external gate voltage. Yeah? Is there a ferromagnetic? A ferromagnetic, yeah. Insulator. Ferromagnetic insulator, yeah. So now, uh, so there are even, uh, so this is the one uh, effect that uh, uh, was predicted, another, pre uh, but only realized this year. But there are even more uh, intriguing uh, uh, tests. Uh, when you look at uh, a Davis uh, t-shirt uh, characterization of the standard model, this was one peculiar term, uh, which I noticed, and maybe some of you didn't, uh, that is called a theta term that couples to F mu nu wedge, uh, F mu nu wedge F mu nu, or F, wedge, F mu nu F mu nu dual. It turns out this is the topological term for topological insulator, because the conventional Maxwell term knows about geometry, is insensitive to topology, but the F mu nu wedge, uh, F mu nu, F mu nu dual term, uh, it's actually completely written in terms of the epsilon tensor in the contraction without involving the metric tensor. And furthermore, there's a symmetry that if you shift this theta angle to theta plus two pi, it's a period of the system. So that's why you can classify time reversal invariant into two different broad classes. Either the one theta equals to zero, of course, it respects time reversal symmetry. But under the operation of time reversal, theta goes to minus theta. So if it's pi, uh, time reversal becomes minus pi, but we also say theta there's a periodicity of two pi, but the pi and minus pi are periodically identified. So there's only two points uh, that are periodic, uh, the uh, uh, time reversal uh, invariant, it represents a time reversal invariant uh, situation, and theta equals two pi is the non-trivial uh, topological insulator. But that immediately tells you a whole host of interesting phenomena that you can see, and one of them, uh, when Ed Witten studied uh, purely uh, out of mathematical interest, uh, what are the consequences of these, he actually predicted that a magnetic monopole will carry charge. But we can do here the opposite because we don't have magnetic monopole. But now if we have charge, by the same argument as Ed Whitten went through, it would predict the charge behave like a magnetic monopole. Because if you're dangling this little charge on the surface of the topological insulator, for any ordinary material, you will induce an image charge, image electric charge. But if you have in addition, and that's according to the uh, Maxwell uh, equation, but now if the Maxwell equation receives a, a contribution due to the theta term, then the charge will, the image charge will not uh, be an image electric charge only, but also an image magnetic charge, which behaves like a magnetic monopole. So a magnetic monopole has a unique force distribution, and if you take an atomic force microscope, you can actually detect what is the force law and uniquely tell the, what's the location of the magnetic, uh, magnetic monopole. So this is like the operational definition of what a magnetic monopole is. But that experiment has not been done yet. So also when you have this 3D topological insulator, uh, you have, uh, if you put the magnetization, uh, it breaks time reversal symmetry, and then it can open up a gap. But now if the magnetization has a domain wall that it switches from up to down, then on this boundary, there lives also a chiral channel. 
and that chiral channel uh, 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 again is dissipationless. So now DARPA, the U.S. agency of uh, which funded the internet, is now funding us a big project uh, to use these as an interconnect inside semiconductor chips because it uh, has very little heat dissipation. And so the standard body for semiconductor industry has now also adopted this proposal as uh, one of the best proposals to solve the problem of heat dissipation inside semiconductors. So these abstract mathematics can really one day go inside your laptop computers and we will never experience the kind of problem we ex uh, experienced earlier this morning. Uh, but anyhow, uh, so when we uh, go one step further, uh, I have here listed this cartoon picture that you have the quantum core state where you have a chiral but complex fermion on its edge. Quantum spin core state, you have a Dirac fermion but has to be strictly massless because of the protection of the time reversal symmetry. So these are the two insulating states. But now you can take a superconducting version of it. Rather than an insulating gap, you have a superconducting gap. So this counterpart will be called a chiral superconductor, and this counterpart will be called a chiral superconductor. And here you have only one edge state. You were already saying, wow, this is already the minimal state you can have, only one channel going forward, but still has two different particles. Just like we said repeatedly, you can have a particle-like state or anti-particle-like state or hole-like state. Because it's an insulator, the concept of filling, uh, you can fill some states here or take out some state here. But once you have a superconductor, uh, it's the charge conservation is only obeyed modulo 2, and you can have on the edge state a chiral Majorana fermion. So that it only has one chiral branch, but also the particle and antiparticles are identified, and similarly here. So now the holy grail is to look for these kind of superconducting version. That's why in the title, topological insulator and superconductors. And one place we know for sure in nature, uh, one material system that definitely is a topological superconductor is actually the helium-3 B phase. So the helium-3 B phase actually is a P wave pairing state of the fermions, uh, of helium-3 fermions, but actually has a full gap. But then on the surface, it should have a Majorana cone rather than a Dirac cone. That's again a theoretical prediction. Uh, uh, the experiment has not uniquely nailed this down yet. There's also a very interesting mathematical structure that uh, the way to realize this chiral superconductor is when you have a chiral Fermi surface and an anti-chiral Fermi surface, and if the pairing amplitude has the opposite sign on these two Fermi surfaces, this is a signature to have a time reversal invariant topological uh, superconductor. Very recently, we have started uh, collaborating with Ed Witten, uh, who also got very interested in, uh, in this subject. And so you remember that in the case of a topological insulator, the theta angle is fixed. Uh, it's either zero or pi, uh, respecting time reversal symmetry. And theta equals to pi characterize the topological insulator. Now, if you have a topological superconductor, superconductor has a phase angle degree of freedom due to the Goldstone uh, theorem. And so what we showed in this joint paper is that this theta angle of the superconductor actually acts like an axion field for F mu nu, F mu nu dual, uh, which is uh, very interesting. So this is my last slide. And uh, so, um, uh, so uh, I actually first want to show this. Uh, the TI really is branching out to all different subfield of condensed matter physics, semiconductors, magnetism, superconductivity, quantum core, and so on. But when we really look at the future of physics, we know that in particle physics, to do real experiment is getting harder and harder. But here, in this beautiful world of topological insulator, we have all these exotic particles, the axions, Majorana, fermions, magnetic monopole, and so on. And very recently, we also find that this modular invariance which is so essential for string theory is a diagnostic tool to detect topological stability. And this is my concluding slide. Thank you.